Hello, my name is Ryan, and I'm joined by a couple other contributors here from Rogue's Portal, and today we will be talking about the 2016 Game of the Year. 2016 in gaming has seen lots of highs, lots of lows, ups and downs, and of course, a bunch of good games for us to enjoy. You can find me online at Ryan M. Holt on Twitter, and of course through Rogue's Portal. I've been doing movie reviews, but have since moved on to the wide world of gaming, so why don't I have the other contributors introduce themselves? Yep, uh, David Hildebrand. I write articles for Rogue's Portal, and I am also on the podcast that we have, The Comics Agenda, and you can catch me on Twitter at Psychotic, and that's spelled at, excuse me, that's spelled S-Y-C-O-T-I-C. And I'm Robert Koffel. I am a uh, relatively new contributor to Rogue's Portal. I mainly write comic books reviews and try to get some uh, interviews and news out there. You can find me on Twitter at Robert Koffel. My last name is C-O-F-F-I-L. Also, I'm on Facebook. You can just type in my name, Robert Koffel, and you'll be able to find me there. Perfect. So today we're going to start with what we've been playing. So what have you guys been playing recently what is now playing in your system of choice i'm a big xbox one fan mm -hmm. um i used to be a hardcore playstation fan until playstation screwed up the socom series so, <laughs> yeah socom was always my favorite shooter i've always loved it uh playstation 3 struck out both times with that and then when they pretty much said the SOCOM series is done, good luck. That's when I said, well, good luck to you too, PlayStation. And I moved on to the Xbox One. Um, games I've been playing lately, I am a hardcore Battlefield fan. I will That is my shooter of choice. I prefer that over Call of Duty any day of the week. Uh, this new Battlefield One is, you know, World War setting. It's interesting. It has its flaws, but that's probably been the biggest thing i've been playing lately between that and i'm also a uh, big soccer junkie i also play soccer so fifa's been rotating in and out with battlefield also sprinkled in there is the new nhl because it's finally nhl is worth getting on the newer gen consoles in my opinion what? So snag that. hey i'm just saying that's I, the other showings didn't impress me enough to buy it this one i picked up and I've also been playing Gears of War 4 here and there, but it's not capturing me as much as I was hoping it would. Okay. Uh, how is that Gears of War 4? Do what? Do what? How is it? I mean, it's, uh, it's Gears of War. <laughs> I mean, let, well, let me say first, I, I'm not a big single-player campaign person. Mm -hmm. I love multiplayer. So... If it's, I know some games they reward you for playing the campaign. They give you stuff to use in multiplayer. Unless it's something I really have to have, I don't play the single player. I stick to multiplayer. So like you know, the Gears of War four, it's it's Gears of War. It looks a little bit prettier. It gave you, uh, I, I think it gave you a couple of the older maps, which is cool. One of them is that gridlock map, which is on uh, with all the scattered cars. I like playing on that again. But yeah. overall, it's just it's. Gear, I mean, not to say it's bad, but I mean, once again, it's Gears of War, so. Yeah, it's just yeah. following the uh, same formula that the others have and just kind of rehashing that, but with prettier paint. Right, it does look good, and I was hoping it'd move a little bit smoother, but you still got the slow and sluggish characters, you know. Yeah, and it's still that uh, popping cover gameplay back and forth. I always liked it because it was a little more tactical than like call of duty or halo but i i got uh gears of war 3 and that was kind of like the final one for me and i keep going back and forth on if i really want to get uh four or not and i just i keep i'm sitting on that fence still is it still glitch when you get out of cover do what i remember i played gears of war 2 pretty heavily but i remember like pulling in and out of cover was absolutely horrendous and i was like it, it almost made the game unplayable for me it's the same basically uh, it's whoever can get to their shotgun first <laughs> <laughs> oh no perfect robert what have you been playing um to be honest i uh with the assassin's creed movie coming out this week 
Um, I'm a pretty big Assassin's Creed nerd. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went back. I, I bought Unity the day it came out, um, and it was glitchy. And I think we're like three years past it original date, and I just beat it today. Um, and the glitches aren't as bad as when the game was first released, but it's still there. Um, just got finished crushing Syndicate. Um, been playing that heavy. And, you know, can't do without my FIFA. So I'm, I'm pretty heavy on FIFA. I do the seasons and usually play with, like, Everton or, you know, Go Toffees or a team like that and try to get higher up in divisions. Um, but those are, those three games have been my mainstays lately. Fantastic. I heard uh, Syndicate's a lot like the Batman games because there's the grappling hook component from that. So, like, how does that work, like, traversing those environments? So, so I'm, I'm just, like, giving a little background. Like, Assassin's Creed was good before the Batman games became good. Like, Assassin's Creed 1, um, I think that came out, like, my first year of college. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is exactly what a bat- get Batman game should be like. And we've all seen the rise of, you know, those Batman games. And they're doing, like, box office numbers and everything. And the, what really actually took me away from Syndicate is the grappling hook. I mean, it, it, it went from being, like, you traversing across rooftops and feeling really in the time set the time frame and setting that you were in to being batman i mean you could shoot across buildings you would glide across cities and they they spend all this time and effort and energy building up london but you can just fly right over it because you're on the grappling hook and it really took a certain immersion out of it for me which why it took me so long to to play the game and really get through it do you hope to see some of those elements in the movie or do you hope the movie kind of harkens back to like that golden age of Assassin's Creed one and two? Those seem to be the gold standards that everybody's chasing. Yeah. I mean, my favorite Assassin's Creed game was um, Revelations when Ezio is older and, you know, he's he's like, I think, in his late 40s. And he he's still doing the assassin thing, but you can hear him grunting. He's not as good at climbing as he used to be when he was younger. Um, you're in Istanbul, which is a giant city, really at the height of its power. Um, and I think that's that's very much what the I know the initial reviews for the Assassin's Creed movie doesn't um, look very good or the reviews aren't very good. But I think, you know, like we were talking about and being in Granada and they can really capture that scenery and do that. I, I think that'll be really cool. Um, really what I just want to see is like, you know, some his- history mis- mixed in with fiction and then throwing the, the plight in of not really good versus evil, but free will versus predestination, which is the overarching themes of the Assassin's Creed games. And I think as long as they capture that, it'll, it'll be successful, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I read one thing that they're doing, which I think is really cool, is when um, Fassbender is going to be in the Animus mm-hmm. um, in Granada, it's all going to be in Spanish with English subtitles, which I think is perfect for that like sort of immersion that you're talking about. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, just to show you how how far the series has fallen, I mean, uh, Assassin's Creed Unity was supposed to be it's, it's in France during the French Revolution, which is absolutely my favorite period of time, and they gave everyone UK accents, and it was it didn't work for me at all. You know that classical rendition mm-hmm. of foreign language, and it, it it just I was like it, it completely pulled me out the game, you know, and I was like, oh. But if they're doing it in Spanish, full-blown Spanish, I think that'll be very cool from an immersion aspect. Perfect. Well, uh, speaking of video games and movies, the one I've been playing a lot recently is I went back and I've been playing Star Wars Dark Forces, which is an old Doom mod from the early 90s that has you stealing the plans of the Death Star. Um, and it's it's so weird, but it's so good good because it's it's got that like old school palpable feel to it and it's <laughs> one of those first like doom games like you don't even have a uh, lateral movement you can't aim up and down you can only aim left and right and yeah. just re-experiencing that and exploring where that 
storyline came from that was used in Rogue One has been really cool, especially because um, one of the writers on Rogue One is actually an old video game uh, journalist who used to write for PC Gamer. So he knows all of that history, so it's kind of cool, you know, seeing, you know, a a games journalist, quote-unquote, make it in a different media. So, you know, going back and playing that's been a lot of fun. But let's not talk about what we have been playing. Let's talk about the reason we're here. Uh, 2016 is coming to a close, so there have been a bunch of games coming out, and we need to talk about the game of the year. And I think the two big ones that have had the most societal impact and the most gaming impact this year have been Pokemon Go and Overwatch. Um, I'm I'm fine starting with either one. Did you guys have a preference on which one we wanted to speak about first? No, I'm good with whatever. Yeah, if you guys want to go ahead with Go, that that's fine by me. Yes, yeah, so let's let's go with Go. Um, <laughs> so uh, Pokemon Go came out early in the summer, and it was this foray into mobile gaming that I don't know. I think it. Initially, I think it kind of missed its mark, you know, when of all of the AR and people walking around and trading and battling and capturing creatures in these exotic locales. And then all of a sudden the game comes out and rural players are screwed and urban players are the ones that are getting the full quote unquote Pokemon Go experience. Um, but that being said, it's still a lot of fun and it's the game that, you know, a lot of people keep coming back to. Does anybody else have any thoughts? (laughs) Um, when I, I downloaded it, I've never been huge on Pokemon Mm -hmm. and I know I downloaded it as being part of when we were talking about it on Rogue's Portal when everybody was submitting their thoughts on it. Um, Right now, I'm still sitting at about a level five, and the reason why is, I guess, my where I'm at, you're talking about the regional and everything. Now, I work in in a city, but at lunch, I got things to do. I'm not going to walk around trying to play Pokemon. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, but there's like, there was stops along the way, like there was a 7-Eleven that gave me free stuff, and then, you know, there was like a gazebo nearby. I mean, I had a lot of landmarks near my work. But I come home, I live right across from a river, mm-hmm. and there's like <laughs> three or four street lamps on my street. So houses are like few and far between. Mm-hmm. So if I was catching anything, it was the same damn rat over and over and over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, and that's all I was catching. And I'm like, this is stupid. I am turning into uh, Willard. I have a collection of rats and I can't do nothing with them. <laughs> so from from time to time I'll still pull it up on my app. I found it interesting because I think for the first time in a long time I went to a church and that was purely because I needed Pokeballs. So I was sort of amused at that, you know, and joked around with my friends about that. that that's what it had to take me to get me into a church parking lot. <laughs> so I I don't hate the game. I know they're doing improvements. I think the the latest update's out now. So I might check it out again. But like I said, right now I'm out of Pokeballs. So I guess eventually while I'm around town at work, I'll have to stop somewhere just to pick some up so I can, you know, play with it more. Because actually I was was somewhere the other day and I was bored and I pulled it up. And as soon as I pulled it up, there was five of them standing around me. And I didn't have... None of these five, and I had no Pokeballs to catch them with. And I was like, well, damn, I was kind of bummed out. I was like, well, you know, I could have actually done something while I was standing here. So it's fun. I would like to see different games maybe use the same engine, the same style, the same operation. I don't think you, you know, don't just be limited with Pokemon. Like I said, I was never a huge, huge Pokemon person, but for Mm -hmm. what it is, I enjoyed it. I mean, it's fun. But like I said, just because of where I'm at throughout my day, it's hit and miss if I'm going to catch anything, you know, if it's worth really my time spending with it. 
Yeah, I was always having problems um, during my commute because I ride the train downtown every day. And once I get downtown, it's great. You know, there's stops every half a block. There's Pokemon as far as the eye can see. But even like that commute and sitting on the train, like the train's going too fast. So I can't hit my stops. And it's because it's also going too fast, I can't hit any Pokemon along the way. But once I get into that concentrated uh, urban area, it's totally different. You know, it's I'm taking 10 steps and there's brand new Pokemon to catch. And I think it does a real disservice based on what was advertised. But I think ultimately the benefit of it, and this is something you kind of touched on, was that it does get you out exploring the community. I found out right around the corner from my house, there's a huge bronze statue sculpture garden that I had no idea was there. And I've been living in the same place for like three years now. And because of Pokemon Go, I'm all of a sudden outside and exploring my community in a way that I've never really interacted with it before. So I think the line between novelty and game is something that is a huge strength that Pokemon Go has that a lot of other games, quite frankly, don't. Yeah, right. I, 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 um, I'll tell you, I, I don't play Pokemon Go. A lot of my friends are up to their neck in Pokemon being level 20, 25, and still, you know, all the way in. I, I go drink on Saturdays at, at our local brewery. Um, it's a poke, it's a Pokestop, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we have people in there, at least when the game was uh, first started, I think back in August, and we everyone was just really excited about the game, talking about the game. Um, it was almost like being in a high school cafeteria where you're talking to people at different tables when usually you're all like huddled around each other and just talking to each other and keeping uh, you know the, the conversation conversation at the table. And I mean, the the manager of the uh, the brewery was giving out free beers to people who were dropping lures because uh, the i guess the lures bring out pokemon which bring more people it it, it was uh, when you talk about a social media phenomenon it, it was absolutely insane people were coming by didn't even drink never been to um saint george's it was it was just watching being an outsider sort of looking in it was it was incredible the amount of people that were doing things they had never done before because of pokemon go and I know I saw a couple articles where people were doing it at like hospitals and like charities and everything. I thought that was a pretty cool thing too. Yeah, and I think ultimately, like even though the game, the game part of it is, you know, it's a little shallow. It's very, very simple, very easy to access. But I think the larger social implications is what made Pokemon Go so special compared to everything else that came out this year. Because, like you guys were saying, like, oh, people are helping at hospitals and stopping by breweries they've never been to. And I think it really helped engage the community as a whole. And especially because it was, I think, the biggest strength was it was on a mobile device. It's not regulated to, you know, the 500, 800 people or so that have a 3DS. It's, you know, everybody's got a smartphone, so why don't you have this game, you know? I think that's part of the strength of it as well. And one thing that did bum me out, going back to my personal experience with it, is, like I said, I'm a big soccer fan, so every weekend I'm up early and I'm watching the games. But while I'm doing that, I'm on my treadmill working out. So when I found out you could put these eggs in this incubator and they would, hatch depending on how far you traveled Mm -hmm. when i found out it wouldn't work on my treadmill that kind of (laughs) bummed me out too yeah it it uses a uh point to point like it calculates your distance based on uh where you start and where you finish at after a certain interval and i know that uh drives a lot of people crazy especially um people that don't really have that option specifically like we were mentioning earlier the hospitals and things like that like there are now now like with the most recent update there are pokemon you can only get through eggs and you know if you're a child who's sick and sitting in a hospital bed for you know 48 72 hours that's kind of a bummer 
You just want to play Pokemon, and you can't get the new ones because you can't move. Anyway, um, on a less somber note, uh, let's talk about Overwatch. Uh, I think Overwatch has kind of taken the world by storm, and it's been winning Game of the Year left and right, and I think for pretty good reason, which is really weird because it's only a multiplayer-focused game. There's Man, these... so Overwatch is, is amazing. And, and, and I mean, I think it, it trumps... It, it, it shows the industry how to do video games. Think about it. Blizzard released a game that they failed to make into an RPG as a multiplayer game, and it dominates. Like, yeah. everyone... Everyone I knew that played video games was playing Overwatch for like a period of three months, and and I think I'm not an FPS person. I I actually I, I always tell my friends I don't have Twitch reflexes, and it's the reason why I don't play shooters and the reason why I don't play fighting games. Um, but what Overwatch does is is every character, all the classes. Like if you want to be a shoot 'em up guy, you have those Soldier 76s over there, and for someone like me who's a uh, um, you know, like a support guy, I can be my mercy and not be re- heavy, re- heavily reliant on, you know, having those quick fingers or quick thumbs that are needed to be successful in, uh, in, in regular traditional FPSs. And they're releasing content without charging you for it. I mean, it used to be back in the day, you would get a game and it had everything in it. And now what you're seeing is like, like EA and, um, Ubisoft are releasing these games that are partially done and expecting you to pay the full full price for them, and 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 then when the additional parts come out, it's another fifteen twenty bucks, you know. And and the game in the beginning wasn't good, and the additional content makes the game a little bit better. Overwatch came, and it was ready to go and awesome, and they're still releasing content that this makes the game better and more expansive and these videos that are doing are really cool blizzard blizzard is just killing the game and they deserve all the praise i definitely agree i think um right now i'm sitting at right like 348 hours on overwatch right now since it's came out um i was playing earlier this afternoon and that i think you bring up a good point as far as that free content that they keep rolling out because you're right. I mean, when we bought, uh, my wife and I bought Arkham Knight earlier in the year, she was like, okay, well, I'm going to buy the game, but you have to buy the season pass. And it was like, wait a second, hold on now. Like, this is a hundred dollar game. Is it going to give me a $100 experience? Whereas Overwatch is you buy it. You have every character unlocked from the outside. There's not, like, this free-to-play rotation of, oh, this week everybody gets these six characters. It doesn't follow that same model of, like, um, League of Legends or um, Dota 2 or Heroes of the Storm or anything like that at all. And I think because you're paying for that complete package, everybody feels like their purchase is warranted and their purchase is worth it. And I think that's why, that's part of the reason why there's such large returns. Overwatch is dominating in Major League Gaming right now and competitive play and even, you know, plebes like me who can't get past rank silver in competitive. Everybody's playing this game nonstop. And I think it's because there's such a low barrier to access. On the PC, it's $40 and you get everything. On the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One, it's $60. And you get everything. You get the Halloween updates, the Olympic updates, the winter updates. You get all of that for free. And I think that's part of the game's strength. Not to mention all of the characters are like incredibly kick-ass in their own individual way. I don't think there's a single character in that game that sucks. Especially from like a design standpoint. What, what first caught my attention, of course, was it was multiplayer only. So right away, it, like I say, it caught my attention. And in my opinion, it's it's a shooter, but it's also a chess game. You, mm-hmm. know, you have to have... You're very right about that. Absolutely right. You have to have that strategy. You know, one of my favorite guys is Reaper. 
So mm -hmm. he's always my go-to. I pick him. But if I start seeing what's going on on the other side, then you adjust. And that is, you know, not to lead right into a negative thing, but that is one thing that frustrates me about the game is sometimes you get into a game and you have these people that are just so hard-headed they want to stick to their favorite character when you're getting your ass handed to you. You know, you have to be able to adjust on the fly, notice the changes, make the changes so you can win the game. You know, stop being selfish and care about your kill to death unless win the game. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. Right, you know? So, but like I said, lately I've been playing a lot of Battlefield and a lot of FIFA. So I know they have some new updates with Overwatch. I need to get back onto it. I think when... um. I had played like a last full season. I landed somewhere in the higher upper tier, so I didn't replay it. I was like, "Well, I'm I'm good with what my rank is right now, so I'll I'll keep going with it." But I like it because, like I said, you have to know the strategy, and you have to know when to use your specials. Like with Reaper, I nothing is more satisfying than seeing <laughs> someone hold the control point, me teleporting right in the middle of all of them. And seeing all of them hurry up and try to react, and I just land my special on them and just wipe out the entire squad and take that checkpoint. Yeah. I've played the game yeah. since launch, and I still get a sense of satisfaction when I make that happen. Yeah, and I think um, that's like one thing that I think helps build the community a lot with Overwatch is you have that stupid the thing we all hate is play of the game and it's Bastion in his turret form sitting in the corner, just mowing everybody down. But like when you land those moments, you know, those really heroic moments of, Oh my gosh, like I did that. That's cool. That's awesome. I think, I think that's part of the fun really, especially yeah. when you land those and everybody's like, Oh man, that was so cool. Like <laughs> it's awesome. Right. And then, and I'm famous for this, too. If I see you sitting in a corner with that sniper rifle, I'm going to snitch on you. I'm going to jump up beside you. I'm going to shoot <laughs> in the air. I'm going to draw every single piece of attention to you so they kill you and get you out of that damn corner. Move. <laughs> you ain't doing nothing. Move, you know? Yeah. It drives me up the wall more than that. But, that's, but see, that's the thing I like about it, too, because lately, and like you said with the season's pass, I do not buy a season's pass for anything. And like I said, I love Battlefield more than anything on this earth, but I have never bought a season's pass for Battlefield. Mm -hmm. If the new maps come out and they sound cool, then you know what? It's my own choice. I bite the bullet, I pay a little bit more, and I get the select packs that I want. But I will never buy a season pass purposely for that reason. I'm getting tired of getting a half ass game. I have to wait for 16 updates for it to be complete, and then maybe I can get into a game without getting booted. You know, I, I'm tired of it. So for this game to come out and make me feel the way it does when I play it. I mean, I'm into it and each game, even if we're losing because I want to try and help and bring it back to win, you know, simple games like call of duty is so worn out. Now if I win or lose at call of duty, I don't care. Yeah. Call of duty is just yeah. an arcade action shooter at this point that has lost its soul. You know, so Ooh, I, I don't so care. <laughs> Do what? I was just saying, tell them because I mean, the soul out of that game is long gone. It's like a hollow husk walking around at this point. It is. It's bad. I mean, because I don't think last year they were like, hey, look, you can play Call of Duty for free this weekend, two weeks before Christmas. I don't remember them doing that last year. It happened this past weekend. And you know what? I still didn't download it. You're in space now. Why? You have Guns N' Roses doing your commercial, which kills me because they are like my all-time favorite band still. You're not going to sell me with Axel and the gang either. I don't want your game anymore. Go back to what made you good. And that's what. And that's the thing. Overwatch 2, which you know there's going to be one. I hope there's going to be one. Man, I, I, don't, I don't know about that. I, I mean, think Overwatch is just going to keep going. I think they're going to do yeah. free updates. I mean, eventually there's going to have to be some... There's currency gonna exchange like, gonna hit your limit. yeah there, there's going to be a currency exchange eventually but i mean overwatch came out earlier this year and we've already gotten two free characters there they've already given us one free map and then there's already on the test realm there's another free map in the works so i think this 
kind of pattern of character map, character map, character map, I think they can sustain that for a while, not to mention the revamped arcade mode. Like, you're talking about, like, all of these players that, like, oh, I'm only going to play one character and things like that. Like, my favorite mode in the entire game is Mystery Heroes, where every time you die, you respawn as a new hero. And I think, overall, it makes me a better player at the game because I understand each individual character as opposed to, you know, that jackass who just wants to play Hanzo the entire time. <laughs> and or Genji. I, yeah. Genji. Yeah, and I think that having these this wide breadth of modes, even though it is still all multiplayer, like the 3v3 mode is fantastic because that gets more into that strategy that you were talking about where it's pick counter pick. Like, oh man, they killed us last time. And they had a Reinhardt, a Mercy, and a Soldier 76. Okay, so now we're going to counterpick against those three and hope that we come out with the win. And it's got that that back and forth, that strategy, that cooperation that I feel like games that like Call of Duty don't even come close to touching. Because Call of Duty, back when I was playing it at least, was a very single-player, multiplayer experience. Like, it was... Very rarely were my friends all online at the same time, so it would just be me queuing by myself. And it seemed like everybody treated that game as, like, every man for themselves. And I think Overwatch, that's part of their strength, is there's not a team deathmatch mode. It's all move the payload, capture the point. And right, because right. it's team-based, yeah. And see, that's the thing that I like about Battlefield, because you have to capture the flags the you know the choke yeah. points whatever call of duty is purely hey let me see if i can go 25 and one yeah and that's and so, that's you know, 20 25 kills one death you know let that that is a selfish game that is just to see your stats go up because in the end even if you lose you still get like what half the points it doesn't really affect you any you just you know you whatever you know like i said the soul the soul of that's gone Definitely. I, I definitely agree for, for sure. I, I, mm. Go ahead. I will say, I think that I play on console at least. And I know sometimes like if I'm not playing with my friends on, and I love Overwatch, I mean, I'm just saying this to be a little bit critical. Um, like if you're, if you're just doing, I guess the, the random matches, sometimes you'll come into a group and no one wants to, no one wants to talk like they play and the, the game forces you to play in a, in a, in a teamwork manner. Like you have to work together, but I just hate the fact that we are playing this game and sometimes no one wants to talk or communicate about what's going on, who's where and um, what we can do to be better at doing this, you know? Yeah. And I think like, I mean, I'm just going to keep coming back to that character design aspect of it all because it's, and like, that's what makes Overwatch so unprecedented too. It's like, all right, well, we're Blizzard. We're known for, you know, saving Korea's economy through space Marines and aliens and, (laughs) you know, making a million dollars off of our Lord of the Rings knockoff. So let's do superheroes and let's make a shooter, which we've never made before, by the way. We've never made a shooter in our entire development career. And to have them have such a strong property and a strong win, as far as Overwatch is concerned, right out the gate, just really shows their strength as a developer. You know, like. The crazy thing is, it wasn't meant to, like, this failed the development cycle. Like, yeah. if you read the story, this game was supposed to be, like, a, a shooter-slash-RPG, and they couldn't make it work. They, 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 No matter what they did in the seven years of testing, it didn't work, and they just released it, like, as a multiplayer. And, I mean, that speaks to the strength of their design team, the strength of the design character that they have, that they, even though it failed the development cycle, they're still really able, able to release this brilliant game. Yeah, and, I mean, I'm just... I'm taken aback by the fact that, you know, it's a shooter. Blizzard's never done that before. And <laughs> I mean, like, I don't I don't want to like kind of jinx it, you know, but I want to give credit where credit is due. They did something that was completely outside their wheelhouse and it's all anybody can talk about. Right, they made it work on every possible level they could have done. Yeah, exactly. 
And so if there's a problem, they fix it without charging you fifty bucks for it. <laughs> yes, yes, and that's that's also very important as well. Um, so they also cater to me. I like playing the soccer game. <laughs> yeah, Lucio Ball was a ton of fun. Lucio would skate around and play soccer. This they, they read my mind. Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, he is Brazilian, so it's it's almost in his genes at this point, right? Right. Yeah, I love Lucio. I think Lucio is probably the character I have the most playtime with overall. Symmetra! Symmetra! Yeah. No, Symmetra's really good, especially with her rework that they gave her. And that's the other thing is, like, you know, when we're talking about content and things like that, like, Symmetra is completely different than when she released. And you didn't have to pay for it, you know? It was a balance change. That was made with a very specific intention for a very specific reason. And I think, honestly, like when I see a Symmetra now, you know, coming up against me, I'm like, all right, well, where's all of her damn turrets? And how far away do I have to stay? Because she's going to melt me if I get in too close. And, right. you know, having like that, that minute change in, in her function just completely changed the character for me. Yeah, and I mean, look at Farah. They did this when the game first started. There were Farah Mercy combos that were just wreaking havoc. And in the first day of it being released, people were like, Farah's OP and Mercy is is like when she, when, when she sticks with Farah, she's OP. And I mean, within like the first forty eight <laughs> hours, they nuked that they they scaled her power back, and the games were were or, or, already that much fairer. Did you guys play during the beta at all? No, I did not. Okay, so... Last time, I think at the time I knew this was coming out, and then what was the other one that was similar to it? Battleborn was coming out. Yeah. Well... So I was going to wait to see what both looked like before I made my decision, and I'm so glad I went with Overwatch. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, But yeah, speaking of those like weird balance changes and things like that, um, in the beta, Bastion actually had a shield similar to Reinhardt's whenever he oh, was no. in turret oh, no. form. So he would go into turret form and he would have like a little shield and the only place you could hit him was on his turret. So like you yeah, couldn't yeah. hit him in his base. Yeah, no, it was complete bullshit. But like, OP. yeah. OP. And seeing like these sweeping changes and things like that, it's it's weird because Blizzard's taking everything they learn from, you know, 15 years of balancing professional StarCraft 2 play into the shooter arena. And like, and wow, the way they balance wow. Too. Yeah. And like, none of that stuff is present in other shooters. Like you don't, you very, very rarely see things like, Oh, we're changing this gun in call of duty to have a slower reload time because it's too overpowered. Like you don't see that stuff. Right. And, and I mean, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say it speaks to Blizzard. It's It speaks to what a company they are, that they do stuff like this. And, like, their video game company, like, Blizzard makes video games. And I, I mean, all the disrespect in the world to EA that has bought every other smaller company and has, like, just gobbled them up and is just trying to spit out as many $60 games as possible and then charging you for every little additional piece that they want to, to add on to it. This should show every other game company and every other game developer that if you if you spend seven years developing a game and, you know, you put, you put blood, sweat, and tears into it, you can get something beautiful. This game has taken the world by storm. Definitely. I... I, I... Cannot agree more. And, like, I'm not going to lie. I'm a huge Blizzard fanboy. I think uh, my main character on World of Warcraft has something like two years of played time on it. Like, I played that character for almost almost 11 years. And oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. I'm, I'm a huge Blizzard fanboy. And I remember when they announced Overwatch at BlizzCon... And I had access to the store, and I immediately bought like three Blizz, uh, three Overwatch shirts. And my wife. Is that what was, you're wearing now? Yeah, yeah. I'm actually wearing a Winston shirt right now. I saw um, the glasses. I was like, oh, yeah. Man. Yeah, I'm actually wearing my Winston shirt right now. And I actually uh, went to a thing when it came out, and I got this Tracer cup. So <laughs> I've been drinking out of that. But, um, 
yeah, when when they announced it, I immediately like I bought three T-shirts for Overwatch. And my wife was like, are you kidding? That game's like not even out yet. That game's not going to be out for another year and a half. And I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like, it's Blizzard. I'm sold on the character design alone. And I mean, they, they did take a big risk. But like, I remember Blizzard back in the heyday when it was like, we're making one game at a time and it's going to be out when it's done. And it was like, okay, well, now everybody's working on StarCraft, and now everybody's working on Diablo, and now Blizzard has, like, seven games in development, like, concurrently between StarCraft, Diablo, Warcraft, Hearthstone, Heroes of the Storm, and Overwatch, and whatever else they got cooking. But, like, it's it's great to finally see them elevate themselves into this cultural phenomenon, and it's going to be really interesting to see where everything goes as far as them pushing the overwatch league next year and how all of that's going to turn out because I think they really want to make a foothold about that. I don't don't know what that is. So what the overwatch league is, is at BlizzCon this year, they announced that blizzard is going to start what they're calling overwatch league and they want it to function similar to like, um, Major League Baseball or the NHL or NFL where, you know, there's like Overwatch is 6v6. So right now, preliminaries, they're saying, what if we did like teams of 10? So that way you can, you know, sub people in and out as needed like you would a traditional sport. And they want to set up hubs in major cities. So instead of the way competitive gaming works now where you sign a sponsorship with a company and you play for a team that doesn't really have like a home base. You're kind of like, it it plays more along the lines in sports compared to like golf, right? Where you have your contract with your sponsors and your sponsors fly you out to different tournaments and you play. And if you win, you know, good for you. Your sponsor gets the thumbs up. Whereas Overwatch League is going to be pushing more, um, local uh, engagement first and foremost. And then furthermore, beyond that, like these global tournaments where you compete as a community. So it would be kind of like, you know, the, the Washington capitals and um, capitals is hockey, right? <laughs> I always get them all confused. Yeah. So it would be like the Washington Capitals playing like the Colorado Avalanche or the St. Louis Blues. But instead of, you know, you might have like the St. Louis Reapers or, you know, like like something goofy like that. And, you know, you have these city hubs set up throughout the country. And like one thing I thought that was really cool that Blizzard did this year at BlizzCon was they did um, the BlizzCon Overwatch World Cup which I thought was really cool. And what it was is regardless of like who you have been sponsored by or what team you play for, things like that, like you play for your country. So they would have, yeah. So they would have like Brazilian players that like normally play against each other. Like, okay, well we're going to put you all on the team and then, all right, so here's all the Koreans. We're going to put them on a team and then here's all the players from the U S and we're going to put them on the team. And I thought that was really cool. And if this Overwatch League kind of copies that, but on a local level, I think it has huge, huge growth potential. And I I would personally like to see it, not necessarily just with Overwatch, but just overall as a whole, you know, be it Street Fighter, Madden, um, Overwatch, Halo, Forza, whatever it may be. I would like to see that as a whole, I think that's the next step for the gaming community. <clears throat> so I, before we get to macro, um, before we get to macro, uh, I just want to take it a little bit micro real quick. I just want to say, I love the characters and, and overwatch. Like I love everyone. Um, I, I play typically a Symmetra and I'll switch back and forth between Winston. Who's an ape. Like Symmetra is an Indian woman. Uh, you know, they're, they're like, the amount of characters that you have and, and, and the diversity there, they have more diversity in this one video game than I've seen in like eight years of playing consoles. You know, yeah. and they just announced today that Tracer 
was uh, was gay, and they did that comic that comic about that. And I just think things like that are, are like the diversity here reflects the diversity in the world at large. And when your games reflect that, and they're good games, they will be successful. Well, and I you think know? that's that's a very interesting point that you bring up, especially uh, when we were talking earlier about like how we all love Lucio and he's Brazilian and things like that. It's like these characters have established nationalities and you know, like they have their own identity. They're not just two dimensional characters on your screen. Yeah. Yeah. It's like how everybody knows, like, you know, James T Kirk. Oh, he came from Iowa. Like, you know, you have like these certain predispositions about these characters, you know, May's Chinese and Tracer's British and Hanzo and Genji are both, from i want to say china it might be japan japan? i think it might be japan because i know korean yeah because i know um diva's korean and actually another stupid blizzard fact diva is actually a professional starcraft 2 player in canon okay and hanzo are japanese perfect but yeah like uh diva is canonically a professional starcraft 2 gamer which is like the stupidest thing, but it's great at the same time. And you know, I think that's so funny. <laughs> I I think that's so funny. Like how she gets her Twitch reflexes in a mech from playing on keyboards. That is hilarious. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's like the one thing all gamers can hope to aspire to be. You know, the superhero who's really good at his job because he played a lot of video games. I think that's that's really funny. But yeah, I think the character design in that game is it's by far its biggest strength. You know, without having these relatable, grounded characters that are relatable to a lot of walks of life. I'm not saying every walk of life, but you know, a lot of them. I think it definitely is a strength of the game for sure. And then can can we talk about those 10 minute shorts that they do that are better than some movies that have come out this year, their <laughs> shorts are better than an entire fantastic four film. But, but those films, yeah, those, those, those overwatch films, they have heart. They have more heart in 10 minutes than, than some films have in two hours. Like that one with Bastion about the, like him awakening from the Omicron war and the bird being his way back into not going back to war. Like that was amazing. Winston and the, the outsiderness that he feels and the love for a human father. Like there, there's so much going on in each one of these characters that they can really flesh out. I hope to see shorts for every single character and more, you know? I want an RPG based on this game. Well, and I think I think the natural progression of this, and it's something that a bunch of people in the Overwatch community have talked about. Um, of course, these are just fans wanting this. There's been no comment from Blizzard. I don't want anybody to think that. But everybody's like, hey, Blizzard, Netflix series, huh, huh, huh? And, like, I would be down. I would be so down to see all of these characters and that kind of back-and-forth interaction just to just to flesh them out, but like I think part of the beauty of Overwatch is like you don't need it. Everybody already relates to these characters based on their design already, and it would be a nice cherry on top. But I don't I don't think you need it. And like when they canceled the graphic novel for Overwatch earlier this year, I was really bummed, and I know a lot of other people were really bummed. Did they say why they canceled it? Um, I don't I don't remember if they said why. I think. It had something to do with this is a story that we want to tell, but I don't think the medium's working, and I don't think we'll ever get a full answer. But I think they just canceled it because, especially um, a couple weeks ago, actually, no, it was last week, um, Blizzard announced that they are opening a publishing arm. And I think the Overwatch comic was originally supposed to come out through dark horse Dark Horse, yeah dark horse. yeah yeah so i could see him i could see him canceling it and per the contract with dark horse they had to scrap the concept and the comic completely and now that they have their own publishing harm they can kind of do what they want with it i think that story isn't going to go away but it bums me out because i was really looking forward to you know 200 pages of dad 76 and reaper just 
messing stuff up. I was I was really looking forward to that. Hey, don't like, don't right forget right. about Reinhardt. Reinhardt and 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 that and that uh Bastion clip where he's taking on all those Omnicrons with his wall. I yeah. was like ten times more of that, please. More of Reinhardt going ham on some robots. Yeah, I I agree completely. And like the the Sombra video, I thought was really good too. And all of this is coming out after the game's released for free. We keep going back to that, and I think that's that's part of it is. You know, as much as the fans are keeping this game rolling by just playing nonstop, like Blizzard's, you know, fueling that fire. They see that desire and they keep pushing it more forward than it was. And I think that's the best part about it. Who was set to write the book? Uh, I don't know who was set to write the book. I remember seeing... um, I'll pull it up real quick. Give me a second. I remember seeing that Humbert Ramos who's one of my favorite artists, he uh, typically does work on Spider-Man with Dan Slott. I remember seeing he had done a couple variant covers for it, but I don't remember. No, it was um, it was supposed to be Michael Chu was going to be the writer. And coming directly from the Overwatch wiki, um, the writer was supposed to be Mickey Nielsen, um, Ludo Lubella, L-U-L-L-A-B-I, was supposed to be pencil and inking it, and it was going to be colored by Ryan Odwadege. What was the artist? Was, um, the artist was Ludo, um, and his last name is L U L L A B I. I have to pull myself back and make sure I don't read too much about the graphic novel because they're talking about the uh, the Omnic Crisis and Anna's there, and it's and I'm like, oh no, I want this really bad. No. Stop reading, Robert. Stop reading. <laughs> I just wanted to bring up, I know I, I always try to bring it ma- micro real quick. Um, I just want to talk about like how this game and like the offense, defense, tank support, like it's very subversive in what we would say is archetypal character design mm-hmm. and what we would normally think of as, you know, these guys are shoot 'em up guys and these guys are are support and healers. I mean, you look at someone like Anna, who is a sniper, but is a support class. And then you look at Lucho, who's playing music to heal and then boost teammates. Like, stuff like that is very subversive. And they, the way they slyly sneak that in, I, I, I thought at least was, was very cool. And Tracer, being a woman on roller skates, who who is like modeled after like those World War II fighter pilots, and I I, I just thought that was amazing in terms of character design. Yeah, I mean I like uh, I would say design wise, my favorite character is probably Zenyatta, um, simply because I like this idea of like an artificial intelligence seeking harmony, and seeking balance. I think those are very human emotions and human methods of reasoning and to have an outsider as far as a robot exploring that like i think zenyatta is my favorite character zenyatta is hard as shit to play and i hate it no doubt because like he he's he's tough to play but like he he's probably my favorite character and like his holiday skin the nutcracker i thought was absolutely brilliant because they replace all of his like harmony orbs with like walnuts and he looks like a giant check out all the holiday stuff when i haven't been i have like i haven't been on i need to go so i can check out all those holiday ones yeah yeah um he's got a pretty cool skin and then um there was one more that was like really super awesome um torbjorn has uh a santa claus outfit and his turret has reindeer ears on it which is just it's it's goofy but it's so much fun that's pretty cool yeah um so what about 2017 the year coming up is there anything you guys are looking forward to from the world of gaming in 2017 oh yes okay yes indeed go ahead what Um, do you got i got mass effect andromeda Mm -hmm. Mass Mass Effect is the only reason I got an Xbox 360. Um, I, I mean, I, me and my friends at the time, like they, the, I, I traded in every single game I had for regular Xbox, and I was still like ten dollars short. And I bought um, an Xbox 360, and I was able to play it over like winter break. And I have like four or five play, playthroughs on each and every release. And I I love the universe. I love the characters. I I love 
everything about Mass Effect, and I can't wait for that. And I, Red Dead, the the Red Dead, the third game. Oh my God. Do you think, honestly, honestly, I have a question for you, and I don't mean to bust your bubble, but do you think that game is coming out in 2017? Yeah, I think it will. All right. We might get it Christmas time. You know, maybe around Christmas time, New Year. If not, we won't see it for a whole nother year. Yeah. Yeah. um, I, I never really got on the Red Dead train. That was never my cup of tea. You know, the pictures that they've released, um, as far as the teaser, it looks like it's going to be Seven Samurai, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. And, you know, Magnificent Seven as well, um, all versions of it, you know, the old one from the 50s and the one that came out this year. And if they give me the ability to swap between the seven different characters like they did in grand theft auto where you could swap through you know the previous three in grand theft auto 5 if they give me that with like the seven different characters and they put you in like a horde mode survival like hold the town and just keep jumping between all of these characters like yeah i would play the shit out of that I'm, I'm I'm not a big Western guy. Like I love Deadwood because it's a great story, and yeah. I love uh, Red 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 Dead Redemption because it was a great story. Like it had it. I don't. I I'll keep saying this. I don't like shooters, but I played the hell out of Red Dead Redemption because I thought it was some of the most compelling narrative I had ever read. I was like, oh my god. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it just kept pushing me forward in the story to figure out what was going to go next. How is this character going to develop? What happens here? What how how is he going to how is Marston going to get you know his his family back? And then when his son takes over the game, which is the most, it's like the biggest jump. They kill the main character. And mm-hmm. then have you play his son as he gets revenge or tries to get revenge. That that was so I don't think any game has done anything like that. I think you got that in like uh Boardwalk Empire. You know, you never I've never seen that done ever in a game. Any anything else you are looking forward to, Dave? Um, this is gonna surprise you all because I said I'm only multiplayer for the most part, but Red Dead Redemption is on my list as well. Perfect. I did I did like the first one a whole lot. Like Robert said, the story is what tied me. I like the characters. I actually enjoyed playing through it. Um I do have a few I'm looking forward to. It's been a while since any of the real the Tom Clancy games have caught me, but this uh the stuff I've been seeing for Ghost Recon. You talking about Wildlands? Yes. So yeah. I'm definitely going to take a look at that. Uh, Friday the 13th, they just released more information on that yesterday. I'm going to at least take a look and see what that's like. Uh, Injustice, I'm looking forward to that to come out. And then, of course, I'm a huge Guardians of the Galaxy fanatic, so I have to check out Telltale when it comes out. Have you played any of the other Telltale games before? I have not. I was going to get into the Batman one. I just haven't picked up and started messing with it yet. Um, if there's any that you get into, um, the ones I definitely recommend are Tales from the Borderlands, which is the Borderlands game, and then um, the Walking Dead series. Um, because if if those games are any indication at all, the Guardians game is going to be awesome. I I I am a huge, uh, not necessarily Guardians fan, um, specifically because it's probably gonna follow like the movie incarnation of the Guardians, which is fine. It's great. I uh, grew up reading the comics where it was a little more gritty and not as jokey. Um, Some of the Dan Abnett run. Or yeah, the, the DNA the- run. Oh, the DNA run, man. Yeah. It- I can't even read the Bendis run because I, uh, uh. yeah, no. And, and that's the thing is because I'm grown in that area of like annihilation and annihilation conquest, like I'll play the guardians one. I'm, you know, I'm a huge rocket raccoon fan. I'll definitely get it. I don't think there's a telltale game. I haven't played. I am probably going to pick up Batman next week when it goes on that steam sale. One is insane. Yeah. That- one a thrones one oh my god well and the thing that's cool about the game of thrones one was it was signed off on the hbo contract so it had all of the um all of the characters were voice acted by their tv counterparts my wife and i were 
actually talking about the Guardians game, and we were like, wouldn't it be cool if it was, like, actually Chris Pratt? Like, do you think that was written into his contract? But sadly, the answer to that is no, because... Guardians actually leaked about two months before it because of the um, Screen Actors Guild strike for the video game industry. It was one of the projects that was listed. So, um, yeah, it's not going to have, unfortunately, Chris Pratt or Vin Diesel or any of them. But I think it'll still be fun for sure. Um, Definitely going to try it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I highly recommend all of the Telltale games just across the board. Um, since you guys are big comic book fans, you might even want to check out The Wolf Among Us, which is um, based off of Fables. Definitely yes, recommend man, that I, one, too. I just haven't pulled the trigger on getting it yet. Yeah, and There's I mean... so much good at everything. It's hard to stay on top of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I would say the two biggest ones I'm looking forward to next year is definitely Mass Effect. I'm curious to see how that evolves, because 3 gave a pretty finite ending that entire saga and but when you go to a different universe i i think it presents it it, it, it presents some interesting possibilities yeah because uh, like they, they have all the races from the old um galaxy or universe or whatever you want to call it galaxy and, like i guess they brought them all yeah with them and and so you have the krogans you got the uh I'm, I'm blanking on liara's race the asari you got, you got everything and i was like oh this more Mass Effect stories, yay! Yeah, and I'm because I have an Xbox One. I'm curious to see if any of like the save file stuff will transfer over, because all three Mass Effect games are backwards compatible on Xbox One, so you can play through all three of them. And then when Andromeda comes out, it'll be interesting to see if I can import into that. But I'm definitely looking forward to that. And then the other one I'm looking forward to is uh, Legend of Zelda The Breath of the Wild. Because that's going to be like the first open world Zelda game. So I'm very curious as to see how that's going to be tackled. Um, I'm definitely not getting it for the Nintendo Switch though. I will be getting it for the Wii U. But I think that game will open up a lot of interesting possibilities into... A side of Zelda that we've never seen before. I've never um, played Zelda before. Do you want to talk about maybe what's different about this game from other Zelda games? Yeah, sure. Wow, you've never... uh, uh, Start with Ocarina of Time. (laughs) If you can. That's probably... That's well regarded as the best Legend of Zelda. I, I don't think it is, but it's the best entry to the series. If you're looking to play Zelda. The big thing that's going to be different with it is there is going to be a storyline but it's going to be set more like a skyrim and less like a linear story progression path really interested anything related to skyrim has me i'm in yeah it's 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 going to be very open-ended and they say that you can complete the game without ever equipping a piece of armor which sounds like some speedrun nonsense that I will never try, but I'm sure I'm going to see videos of people trying and like, oh man, I beat the game without ever, you know, I beat the game with a wooden stick and no shirt. Like, you know, stupid crap like that is going to be a lot of fun. And I, I, I think, you know, just, just having that open world is going to be way different because like even the older Zelda games had like an overworld. Where, like, you would come to a central hub and then go to the next dungeon and then come back to the central hub and then go to the next dungeon and then so on and so forth. But, like, this one is just go in a direction. And if you find, like, a smaller dungeon, you can explore it and maybe find some cool loot and then come out. And it's going to have a story progression similar to Skyrim, which is going to be a first for a Zelda series. So it'll be very interesting to see. Oh, man, that is a loaded question. So, you do play as Link, as far as we know. There have been some teases that you might get to play as Zelda as well. When you start the game, you either pick if you want to play as a male or a female. 
and the male avatar is Link and the female avatar is Zelda. But it's all speculation. Nintendo hasn't said one way or the other, but like they've released some marketing that leans very heavily to the effect of you're probably going to get to play as both. Definitely, I mean, Link for sure. And maybe Zelda is DLC. Let's hope they follow the Blizzard model. Everything at once. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I really hope they do, but I mean, it's Nintendo, one step forward, two steps back. So They're trapped, They're trapped yeah, in their own design. Yeah, I mean, like, Super Mario Run came out this past weekend, and it was like, oh, it's $10, which, okay, I unlock everything from the game to begin with. Oh, that's cool. Oh, but you need an internet connection in order to play? Like, mm, one step forward, two steps back. And, I mean, they they like to get in their own way a lot. I mean, like, even with this um, NES Mini, like, you you can't get it anywhere. And it's like, did Nintendo really think that thing wasn't going to sell? Like, why aren't there more of these out there? It's funny you mentioned that, because I have one, and I actually just started replaying Legend of Zelda probably a couple nights ago. Awesome. Awesome. Is it... So, wh- what about the NES Mini? What do you, what do you think about it? Because... I, I don't have one. I have no desire to get one. I mean, it's it's cool. Uh, you can It gives you three options to save your game, so you can save, like, three separate games at where you're at. Um, I'm not one of these ones that has to rush through and play every single game. Mm-hmm. So there's, what, 30, 30 games right now, and I think I've spent most of my time with Ninja Gaiden, Double Dragon 2, Punch-Out, and Super C, and I just started Legend of Zelda. So I've had it since it's come out and I've only really have been in depth with five games so far just because I've just been playing the hell out of those five games. Yeah. And yeah. you know, there's still Castlevania two, which happens to be my favorite one. And there's a couple other ones that I don't think I've ever even touched. Like I what's it, Ice Climber, is that one of them? I've never even played that. I mean they're in Star Tropics, you know, there there's quite a few on there that I've never even played. So I'm gonna get to them eventually, but like I said, I'm I didn't race through and, you know, tried every single one of them just to, you know, just to do it. I've been spending time with my favorite ones first. It's well worth the sixty bucks. Was it was it tough to find one? I have friends. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can we talk about Ghost Recon Wildlands a little bit? Yeah. And how I went from being not excited about that game to seeing a recent 10 minute playthrough with four people and trying to convince all my friends to buy the game so we can do that. Be- because I haven't been excited for a Tom Clancy game since oh, I think I played the last Ghost Recon, but, um, you know, I blew through that. But this, like, like the open world thing that they're doing, like, akin to Skyrim, where you take down this Mexican or, you know, some some type of Latin drug cartel any way you imagine, that looks amazing. Yeah, and I, like, I think like, the, the huge co-op factor of it is going to either make or break that game. So if you've got four friends, I bet that game's going to be awesome. But if you don't have four friends, I bet that game's going to suck. And I like, I like that um, they're taking all of the best parts of rainbow six, you know, those fully destructible environments. Like I, I've never, I've haven't played rainbow six siege yet. I got down a lot on rainbow six Vegas and Vegas two, but siege is amazing, sir. It is. See, is mm. siege good? if you can pick that up on the cheap, yes, it is a lot of fun. And once again, it's, I'm the can't compare it to overwatch, but it's chess. You have to pick, what you're going to use to attack your house, the house with, because I mean, there's different things. You're either going to defuse a bomb, rescue a hostage, or there's two, there's one um, mode where there's two bombs that you can try and set your thing at. So what it is, is you have your offensive characters, you fly your little drones in and you try to get Intel while you're the defense inside the house is putting up these steel walls laying booby traps, barbed wire, planting and camping where they want to wait for the assault to happen. It can get intense and is a lot of fun. In fact, I think I've actually played more Siege than I have Overwatch. That's awesome. So I And I know they have a big season pass for that. 
I don't like what they've done with it. They'll rotate the maps. I believe they rotate those maps, which is fine, but to get like the skins and the weapons and they have different things that, you know, from microtransactions now, you can save up your coin and buy them. Mm-hmm. It's like you have to like really save up to get it. Yeah, and that's um another one I've been playing a little bit of uh is Titanfall 2 and one thing with Titanfall 2 is they don't have a season pass. It's all free. So, right. yeah, like all, all of their DLC is free. I enjoy it. Um, I haven't played the single player yet. I hear the single player is incredibly well done for, you know, a little 10 hour jaunt into that world. I've just been playing the multiplayer, though, and I haven't touched it in a couple weeks because I went on vacation. And as soon as I came back, it was finals and then the Overwatch uh, holiday patch dropped. But I do know that Titanfall 2 does not have a season pass element to it. It's just everything's coming out for free. I can't be angry at that. I think EA kind of put Titanfall. Uh, Titanfall is made by Respawn, which is the X Infinity War guys that left after Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. That sounds right. I mean, it's 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 really good. It's really solid. The uh, Multiplayer plays a lot like the first one, but with more customization options for the mechs, which is kind of cool. And the first one, it was like you could get a mech with an assault rifle or a shotgun or a sniper rifle. And like that was kind of the depth of it. In this game, like you can get a mech that is codenamed like Scorch and it drops like gas and you can like flood a building with gas and then you can shoot the gas and the gas ignites and it kills everybody in the building That's or crazy. yeah. Or you can get, um, there's one called Ronin and Ronin has like a tiny little shotgun that doesn't do much damage, but he's got a big fucking sword. So like, yeah, you can, and he's got like a stealth module in it. So like wow. you can like sneak up behind people and then gut them with the sword, but it's not like sneaking up on people. It's sneaking up on other Titans. It's a lot of fun, but I haven't had a chance to play it since the first couple DLCs have dropped. I hear the, the story mode's really good. It's only about eight hours long and the multiplayer's solid. Um, yeah. The big thing with it is I'm worried about the longevity of Titanfall two because short attention spans. Yeah. Well, not necessarily that, but Titanfall 2 came out, Battlefield 1 came out, the next week was Titanfall 2, and the next week after that was Call of Duty. So, if you're a shooter fan, are you going to get Titanfall 2, or either Battlefield or Call of Duty? And the answer is, you're probably going to get Battlefield or Call of Duty, and not Titanfall. Which is ultimately a shame, because I, I think Titanfall's really good, I definitely, like, Battlefield's really good, too. And the thing that pisses me off is both of those games, both Titanfall and Battlefield, are published by EA. So why EA decided to release them one week in between each other, just, it's it's a weird business decision. But they want that holiday money. Well, and I understand that, but, like, I don't know. I would have released, if it was up to me, I would have released Titanfall like in the middle of March. Because if you would have released it in the middle of March, it would have been completely dominating the conversation and everybody would be done playing all of their holiday games. Like anybody who, you know, in a couple weeks for Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever, opens up that Xbox with, you know, Gears of War or Battlefield or, you know, their PlayStation with Uncharted and Battlefield or Star Wars or whatever. March is perfect for a game like that because all of a sudden you're done with all of those games and you can dominate the conversation. And it it just really worries me that we're not going to see Titanfall 3 or we're not going to see Infinity or... It's not Infinity Ward. It's Respawn Entertainment. I'm worried that Respawn Entertainment's going to go out of business because this is only their second game. But, like, these these are, like, the guys that, like, birthed Call of Duty, like, back when it was good. They made Call well, of Duty I, 2 and 3 and Modern so, Warfare. Yes, like, yes. so, like, these guys know what they're doing. It's just I think they got screwed over by their publisher. But, you know, EA set this date two years ago, so they have to make the date. I mean that's that that's enough for me on my soapbox, but that but 
Yeah, Titanfall Titanfall 2 is really good. I enjoy it. Is is anyone playing Final Fantasy 15, I think it is? Nope. Nope. <laughs> so, it's it's the only thing on my feed. And like I haven't played Final Fantasy since it was like a ROM on my computer cuz I, I I was too young to catch them on Super Nintendo and I I didn't play 10. I played like 3, 4, Five and six. I remember Kafka being the worst villain ever. But this new Final Fantasy, it's the only thing on my Twitter feed, on my Facebook feed, and people are just ranting and raving about how good it is. And I'm an RPG guy, and I, I'm I'm not really a JRPG guy like I used to be, but it, it has been something that I want to maybe dip my toes in and see if you know this Chocobo is worth writing, so to speak. <laughs> Well, all I know about Final Fantasy 15 is it apparently takes about 65 to 70 hours to complete, and I just don't have that kind of time. My brother-in-law bought it, and I saw him this past weekend, and he said it's really good, and it's a lot of fun. Combat's really good. I think the combat's kind of a amalgam from Final Fantasy... What was the last big one? 12 or 13? Uh, Final Fantasy 13 and Kingdom Hearts. Real time. It, it looks like real time. Yeah, it's a mixture between Final Fantasy 13 and Kingdom Hearts from what I understand. That's not the worst decision you could make. It's it's very, very pretty. And I, I, I just... That's, it's a pretty game. I just don't want to go on a boy band road trip. Like, give me Mass Effect. I would rather, you know... If it was a boy band road trip in space, yeah, absolutely I would be there. But, like, you know, just four guys derping around the countryside, eh, not for me. No, and, and, and you're right. Like, the uh, it, video games, ha- like, it's hard because there's good TV, there's good comic books, there's good movies, and then there's good video games. And then you got to work, sleep, eat, live. Yeah, you know, and, and and where do you fit it all in? I you know I wish I was still a kid and able to afford all my hobbies, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm doing my best to keep up with gaming, but it's it's ridiculous. I haven't. Well, no, that's not true. I bought some comic books over the weekend, but like I'm, I haven't even read Vision number one, which I hear is like one of the best books of the year. Vision, Tom King. He's from this area. He he lives in uh, Northern Virginia. Lovely comic book and Sheriff of Babylon also and Omega Men. He can do no wrong except for that Batman, which is. No <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I haven't even read Vision yet. I, I just I don't have time for any of it and it sucks. But I don't know. I keep making time for Overwatch. So maybe that's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you like Ray, if you like Ray Bradbury, mm-hmm. Vision reads just like a Ray Bradbury novel. Perfect. I actually bought the trade this weekend. Um, I was in D.C. and I stopped by a couple comic book shops. I got that and then an indie called Copperhead, which I hear is like Firefly, but like with more aliens and less humans. And then um, go ahead. The guy who's doing we know the guy, Dave and I know the, the artist who's doing the next arc of Copperhead. That's awesome. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. yeah, I just picked up volume one. I I can't wait to get into it. It's really good. It's really good. Perfect. Perfect. And then the other one I got was, I've been looking for quite some time for the Scotty Young coloring book. Cause he does all my <laughs> favorite. He does all my favorite variants. So it's just like, uh, 10 bucks. Yeah. I'm going to need to baby buy that. X-Men, you know, those baby X-Men covers are amazing. And then they wind up going for double, triple the value online. So yeah, he, yeah. He, he does have his following. He does I, have his following. I've got a couple of his covers. Um, I got a couple of his Spider-Man ones. Like, I have Spider-Gwen and Spider-Man 2099 and Amazing Spider-Man and Captain Marvel and stuff. Um, but yeah, no, like, those were the three books that I need to read. I need to read Vision, Copperhead, and... I, I mean, the coloring book I'm just going to do on my time off. <laughs> <laughs> stress is a stress relief, right? Coloring Absolutely. Relief. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much for your contributions for Game of the Year 2016. We here at Rogue's Portal hope everybody had a great end of the year, and we look forward to seeing what 2017 brings, not only in gaming, but in comics, movies, and pop culture in general. I hope everybody has a great start of the year. See you again.